We're going to continue talking now about the body of Christ and how we really need to see every member of the body of Christ as vital to uh, carrying out God's will in our lives locally and across our countries and across the world. Uh, I continue to be inspired at the, the great diversity among the members of the body of Christ. In fact, I think sometimes about the movies that we have out now with the different superheroes and the Avengers and those kinds of things, and they'll do one movie about one guy and then a movie about all of them together and how you learn about where they came from and their unique strengths and weaknesses and they were bitten by some, what, a spider or something that gave them all these abilities, <laughs> that kind of thing. But then it, it often shows some human frailty that they have as well. But, you know, when you get all the spiritual Avengers together, all the spiritual superheroes together, you, you've got the Hulk, you know, really muscling down on things. And you've got Captain America is all patriotic and he, he can throw his shield. And you've got the, the lady that does this and the other guy that does that. And... Uh, Iron Man is, is flying high and all that. Well, different believers in the body of Christ are kind of like that, aren't they? They've got different long suits and different things they can't do. And uh, sometimes you're good at this, but not good at that. And sometimes the best teacher in the fellowship is the guy that can't fry an egg. <laughs> or maybe the, the person that is so gifted in, in prophecy or prayer or ministering, uh, maybe they're not as good in, in evangelism. But we celebrate. We don't, we don't label each other for our shortcomings. We don't label each other in our memories for the times where we've, we've dropped the ball or stumbled or sinned. That's not how we remember people. That's not how God does. That's not how Christ, your intercessor, thinks of you. So we should never think that way about each other. We should walk in such forgiveness that we don't carry those kind of burdens of labels and false identifications about people. When we accepted Christ as Lord, God planted inside of each of us a unique set of gifted ministries of service, some gifting, some long suits, through which to worship Him and to reach the world. These inherent abilities are imprinted in our new man spiritual genetics, and that enables us to abundantly serve among both the body of Christ and the world around us. You know, these long-suited uh, ideas, these, these abilities are a, a gifting package, you might say, of God-given competencies and aptitudes that make every believer distinctive in their life of service. They are, in truth, a gift to the church by way of God's grace and the believing of the individual. It takes both. In a sense, every believer has gifts to offer to every other believer. So when you see a believer coming, here come some gifts for me. <laughs> These gifts are to be delivered in the right way, meaning in love, and at the right time, meaning as God provides the right opportunities. Uh, these are areas in which we can especially focus our love and our believing and our giving with particular effectiveness these long suits that we have individually. In fact, we commonly gravitate toward areas of service in which we can particularly use our special enablements. What we enjoy doing and areas where we commonly excel are often a direct reflection of these spiritual giftings in us. God has not only commissioned each believer to invoke and impart God's will to the world, but God's also etched inside of every believer unique capacities to get His will out. It's exciting to observe when a believer's area of personal interest and desire and calling meet up with the actual needs of the people and the communities around that believer. I can think of the quote from Frederick Buchner. He said, the place where God calls you is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. I think that's often the case. I'd even want to take that a step further and encourage us to ask ourselves, what about when God calls you to something that maybe isn't your passion? 
What about when you know for sure that he's put sort of a, a burden, is the word I use sometimes, a, a spiritual responsibility on your shoulders? That's how he talks to me sometimes, is, is this growing burden is the word I use. It's not negative, but growing responsibility that I've got to do something about and he's not going to get off my case until I do that. And that's how he works in my heart many times is something that I know that he has uh, sent me to do a mission, a purpose that is different from just general feelings in my mind. Well, this interface of, of gladness and hunger, your gladness and the hunger of the world, this represents a sphere of influence that's open to every believer who has the desire to reach out with the purposes and the passions that God has imprinted on his heart. And like I say, sometimes he will give you an assignment that, that isn't what you really wanted to do, or maybe is not in an area. You know, maybe you're not gifted as an evangelist, but and we don't really know that Timothy was necessarily an, an evangelist, but the Apostle Paul, by revelation, said, Timothy, we need you to do the work of an evangelist. And I think uh, every believer at one time or another may be called on to do the work of every long-suited gifting, even though that particular believer may not be long-suited in all of those areas. You, well, just think about it. If you, if you need to teach another person, you're doing the work of a teacher. If you need to really speak for God, maybe you're doing the word of a prophet, the work of a prophet. If you need to to witness, every believer goes witnessing, so to speak, goes testifying, uh, uses their ministry of reconciliation. Well, that person is doing the work of the evangelist. If you if you plan an activity or plan a project or help solve a problem, maybe you're doing the work of a, a gifted helps and governments person. If you show compassion and forgiveness towards someone who really doesn't deserve it, maybe you're doing the work of someone who's very gifted in mercy ministry from Romans 12. Maybe if you really build somebody up and you encourage somebody uh, in a fellowship, maybe you're doing the work of the encourager uh, that is listed there in 1 Corinthians or in Romans chapter 12 as one of the charismatic gifts, the functions in the body of Christ. You see how you might be called on to do things even though maybe it's not your long suit, but we, all, we certainly want to stay after the things that we are long suited in and the passions that we have, the, the missions and the assignments that God gives. You know, acting in accordance with these unique abilities and capacities gives us fulfillment, satisfaction, and real contentment that every person is born desiring. God's Word tells us that God Himself distributes and energizes gifts and opportunities for service and the effects produced then. Let's read the uh, Corinthians chapter, that, the part of that, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6, that deal with some of this. Verse 4 says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. It's the Father's job and the job of the Lord Jesus Christ to provide spiritual abilities, you know, ways to serve and the energizing of those gifts that they've put within us. That takes a load off of me, doesn't it? And off of you, that we don't do the energizing, they do the energizing. We act and they energize. As we act, God energizes. God will certainly do His part. Our part in the partnership is to effectively use what God has made us in Christ. We yearn to do our utmost for His highest. It's not a striving towards self-righteous performance and personal achievement. That's not what it's all about at all. It's a fervent desire to fully walk in our God-given righteousness, to glorify God and to carry out His calling and His commissioning. We've already achieved just rightness in Christ. God has made you, if He's justified you, He's made you just. If He's made you righteous, then you're right. So you're just right. <laughs> and everybody in your home church is just right in God's eyes and in Christ. So our hearts can be completely free and unfettered to move fast and far with Him. 
after laying out the nine manifestations of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 11, the Scriptures continue with a wonderful double analogy in which the human body is compared to both the manifestations of the Spirit and to this diversity of giftings in the body of Christ. In fact, I'm going to read from our class, Living in God's Power, Part 5, that Wayne Clapp taught so wonderfully. He has a one-body illustration and a little chart where he lists the double analogy of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, or verse 12 through 27 in chapter 12. And number one, he says, the human body is compared to the nine manifestations of the Spirit where each manifestation is an important and integral member of the whole body of manifestations. It illustrates that all nine manifestations are important to each individual believer. And number two, the second part of the double analogy of 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 27, he says, The human body is also compared to the body of Christ, where each believer is an important an integral member of the whole body of Christ. It illustrates that all believers are important to the entire body of Christ. I think that's just tremendously stated. Let's read from the New Living Translation of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 21, and then also verses 25 and 27 through 27. So, verse 12. Just follow along with me and think about this. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. We all share the same spirit, it says in verse 13 there. Now verse 14, yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. Verse 15, if the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, well, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how in the world would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part where He wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. <laughs> yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Then verse 25 goes on to say, This makes for harmony among the members, so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the members, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Well, each part of the human body needs each other part for the entire body to be whole and to fully accomplish its functions and purposes. In the same way, each manifestation of the Spirit is critical uh, and a critical member of the whole body of manifestations, both within an individual's life and as they're operated among a bunch of believers. The second aspect of the double analogy is the comparison between the human body and the body of Christ, as reflected in the giftings of its membership. The foot, the hand, the ear, and the eye, and those things, those kinds of things are mentioned as examples. And as we look across the body of Christ, we can see a wide assortment of gifted energizings, meeting a variety of distinct needs. Well, let's applaud all God's workings. We need to guard against getting so focused on our own long suits in ministry that we're tempted to criticize the distinctive service efforts of another believer. The foot might say about the hand, why is he always grabbing and pointing, holding and patting people on the back? Huh. Can you imagine that? Well, you know, in fact, 
I happen to have an extra foot here of a believer. Ugh, I mean, you, you think that I've, I've reached my own foot up here over the table, right? Down and up. <laughs> okay, that's hard work while you're teaching, you know. Down and up. Stretch. Uh, well, that's the body of Christ. And if I said, hey, give me a hand, you might... You might give me a hand, see? Well, what about these guys? Yeah, ta -ta. What about these two parts of the body of Christ? These are two believers. They each have unique abilities. They each have, uh, they're, they're designed for purpose. They're energized in unique ways. They carry out special benefits and they have uh, special needs <laughs> that are different from each other. Well, this foot could say toward the hand, why is he always grabbing and pointing and holding and patting people on the back? He's great when it comes to hitchhiking, but he doesn't really take the body anywhere. Mm. <laughs> well, the hand could retort back and say, hey, look at that foot. All she does is walk and kick and run. She helps a lot with travel, but she never reaches out to greet people. That'd be kind of silly, wouldn't it? Well... A pastor might question why an evangelist might not seem to excel at tenderly shepherding or being as family focused. You know, some teachers might wonder why a preacher doesn't present the scriptures more deeply. And a preacher might think a teacher is just too intellectual. A prophet might wonder why a mercy giver is not more vision focused. An apostle might question why somebody dedicated to helps and governments doesn't seem more sent on a mission. Unspoken questions might be, why doesn't that other guy emphasize the stuff that motivates me? Why does that lady say it that way? Aren't my ministries the most important ones? Aren't my ways the only ways to move the Word? <laughs> of all the questions that each servant minister might ask himself, Two that trump them all are, what does the Word say? And what does God want in this situation? There's lots of experiences and emotions and feelings and sincerities and inspirations all involved in loving service. The truth of God's written Word will keep all inspirations on track with the truth, taking it back to the Scriptures as we serve. Experiences never determine what is doctrinal truth. We should be deeply sincere about the believing service that we perform, but our sincerity and our emotions and experiences will never trump the written word. That's our checkpoint. That's the critic of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Scripture is the great lie detector. It's, it stamps out truth decay. Yep, remember Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God judges the thoughts and reasonings of the heart, according to the Magira New Testament translation. God's Word separates truth from error in the activities of every type of ministering service. You know, you could, you could have that too between the eyes and the ears. Well, I happen to have a couple of eyeballs here, little extras in case mine wear out. A couple of eyeballs. You know, they could, they could uh, vaunt the importance of seeing in the body of Christ. For example, you know, the eyes could, could say, well, you know, seeing in the body of Christ is very, very important. We need to see where we're going, see where we're headed. We need to have vision for ourselves, vision for the believers, vision for my marriage, vision for the home church group that I have, vision for the home church network in my area. You need to see the adversary coming. You need to see opportunities. Uh, to serve, that's very important. But you know what? These eyes are deaf as a board. Just the eyes alone. And so we need, you wouldn't think that ears as big as mine would even need a visual aid. But yes, my friends, we have ears even bigger. See, the eyes are deaf and the ears are blind as a bat. <laughs> they both need each other, don't they? See, these ears represent that we're hearing from God. 
we're, we're hearing inspiration about God's wonderful Word. And the eyes, for goodness sakes, they're seeing what's happening. You know, some of this is a little silly, but you kind of get the point that we're all members. That's that word for body parts. We're all parts. Parts is parts. <laughs> See, we have different long suits and different callings and different abilities. And, you know, the, the ear just may not understand what that nose is up to. May not make sense at all. But that ear sure needs that nose to sniff out the adversary sometimes, right? But sometimes the nose is having trouble sniffing out the adversary and the ear actually hears the adversary coming. See? Or maybe it's the eye that sees what the devil's up to. And then maybe the hand goes to work to stop the work that's been seen or heard or smelled. Well, we all need each other. We all need each other desperately and I think a lot more than we think we do to carry out our lives. The journey of my life is so interwoven and interdependent on the journey of your life. We should see the family of God so much bigger than we do today. We desperately need each other. In fact, remember Romans 12, 5 says we belong to each other. Each part of the body belongs to the other part. The hand and the ear belong to each other. The eye and the foot belong to each other. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 from the New International Version. Just read along here. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Well, you might ask, how? And then verse 2 says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Verse 3. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Verse 4, There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. To better discover our unique spiritual gifts, we simply, simply jump into today's opportunity to serve. What are the needs of people in your life? What are the open doors for us to speak? What, what's going on in the lives of the people in your faith community? What about your friends and family and fellow workers, people that are in your sphere of influence? Where are they hungry for truth? Where do they need your your touch and your word and your thought and your actions. That's the way to find out what your giftings are by getting into the service opportunities that you have right now, today, those opportunities. If you wait, well, as soon as God shows me that I have a certain position or a certain function or as soon as some you know, leader in the body of Christ calls me and gives me a title, then I'll start functioning. It doesn't work that way. That's the difference in, in function and position. Positions rarely come to anybody who's not functioning. See, really ordination is a public recognition uh, in a group of believers of somebody that's been functioning and that it's obvious to most everybody that that, that gifting needs to be recognized uh, uniquely for the sake of the whole group. Nothing too formal, but deeply spiritual and deeply dynamic. Well, awareness and understanding of our gifts follow our efforts to serve. Our strengths become obvious to those we serve, as we serve. Leaving self-focus behind, doors will abundantly open for us to both operate manifestations of the Spirit and to walk in our spiritual giftings. What a combination of power. What a completeness. What reason for rejoicing and thanksgiving. God has set us up for success by providing a spiritually well-equipped life for true worship of Him and true service to those around us. Let's celebrate how God is working in each one of us, okay? Let's do that. Why don't we turn to close out this segment to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, you can take your Bible, and this shows such a wonderful snapshot of a body of believers standing together. 
frequently, locally, intimately, based on God's Word, focused on Christ. 1 Peter chapter 4, and then in verse 7, look at the characteristics of a home church or home fellowship community, a household, a family. Verse 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober, whole-minded it is, and watch unto prayer. Verse 8, And above all things have fervent charity. That's that word we looked at earlier, that fervent, that stretching out, that ectanase is the word, that, that charity that, that is white hot, that stretches out and reaches out to warm each other, even across long distances. That's the kind of love of God, agape. We have fervent, white hot charity among ourselves. For charity, agape, the love of God, shall cover the multitude of sins. Sin is just missing the mark. Sin is unrighteousness. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin, it says in uh, Romans 14. And it says, without faith it's impossible to please God. So anything that's causing us to miss the mark or to become unrighteous in our walk is, is not a description of the alignment and the harmony and the sweetness of the relationship that we should maintain with God when we walk in the light as He is light. And 1 John 1 says if we, if we find ourselves in the darkness, we'll just get back in the light. That's the way to really confess sin, so to speak, is to discover you're in the dark in some area and get back in the light. You don't have to analyze the darkness. You don't have to condemn yourself in detail or even understand it fully. Just get back in the light. The light burns away the unrighteousness in our thoughts and our lives. Here it says, The love of God covers the multitude of sins. Verse 9, Use hospitality one to another. There's our phrase again, one to another from a previous segment. Without grudging or without grumbling. That verse 9 said, one translation said, Welcome people into your home without complaining. Verse 9, boy, that sounds like a home church group, doesn't it? Verse 10, as every man has re received, and that's the Greek term lambana, received into evidence, into manifestation, the gift, the charisma, as every believer, as every believer has been gifted in evidence. Every believer has been gifted, even so, Minister, diaconia, serve the same one to another. We serve each other with our giftings. The ear is serving the nose. The nose is serving the foot. Everybody. Sometimes we get mixed up and my nose runs and my feet smell. That's my only nose and foot joke I know. <laughs> I know you love me. Um, wow, this says... As every man, verse 10, has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The grace of God is manifold. It's multifarious. It is multipurpose. The grace of God is not just one type of thing. It is divine favor in many different flavors, you might say. Many flavored favor, I guess you might say. Our whole administration that we live in is the administration of the grace of God, according to Ephesians. That is the administration of the charis of God, the favor of God. Our whole administration is called favor. You ought to expect God to give you some favor. You're His favorite, favorite, right? The manifold grace of God. And if you want to understand the grace of God sometime, do a little word study on all the words that have charis in it. And you'll really see what it is to walk in grace and to live in the grace of God. To live in God's divine favor. Like the word thankfulness has grace in the, the Greek term for thankfulness. You want to walk in God's grace? Walk in thankfulness. The word forgiveness, one of the two great words for forgiveness have the word grace in it. That's how we grace each other when we forgive each other. We favor each other. You want to understand how to walk in grace? Uh, gift each other. The word gift has the word charis in it. Uh, several wonderful words in, in a study of the New Testament have 
the idea of grace in it. That's how we grace each other. That's how we, we live in grace. Verse 11 says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, the brief utterances of God, the, the, the great statements of God. If any man minister or serve, uh, let him do as the ability which God gives. It's God's ability in us. That's why we can't beat our chest and be proud of ourselves. Because God has given us these giftings. And why? It says that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, that describes my life and yours. That describes our earthly families as we walk as Christian believers in the greatest environments in the world. You know, our Christian families, our, our, the, our Christian households, our Christian homes are just the greatest places in the world. And that's why we can heal the church, we can heal our marriages, we can heal our communities, we can heal our families all on the same turf where we gather together face to face in the home church environment and then launch out into this world from there. Let's bless each other. Let's walk in this body of Christ and not only thank God for how He's gifted us, but applaud the giftings in every other believer. In fact, here we go. I'll even take my extra hand, and as we close this segment, I'll applaud you with all three of these hands. Hey, good to be with you. Take care of yourself. God bless. Take care.